when you, if you have your Bible, you're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, we, we are taking a break from Romans today. That's, that's Ben. He's going to teach that when he gets back from Israel. And uh, from the pictures I'm seeing, they're having a, a lot of fun in Israel, uh, the whole team over there. So keep lifting them up in prayer. But this morning, we're going we're gonna to talk about love. What Paul calls the more excellent way. You know, as we think of the subject of love, love is commonplace today in the world around us. You probably hear the term every single day, but our, but our English vocabulary is very limiting. And there's only one word that we have for that love for the most part. And so we tend to use the same word for our love. Uh, how, how much, much we, we like, like pepperoni, pepperoni pizza, pizza. as, as what, what we, we do, do for our Savior, Savior our Lord and Savior, Savior Jesus Christ, Christ and our family, our spouse. spouse. So, it's so it's the, the same, same word in the English, it's love, but, love. but, but not so, so in the, the Greek. Greek. In the Greek, there was there actually, actually four distinct words, words describing love, love. Uh, uh, two, uh, two of which are, are in the Bible, and the two uh, are God, which is a self-sacrificing love, and Philea, which is a friendly type of love, a brotherly love. love. Those, Those two are in the Bible, Bible but, but primarily this, this morning, morning I'm going to be talking about God love, love. a self-sacrificing self love. And, 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 and a God love is different than all the other, the other three, three Greek forms, forms of love, and that it is an act of will. It is, it is an act of will. will. You, you can't, can't fall into, into a God love, love anymore any more than, than you can walk by your closet, and fall in, and, and come, come out dressed. <laughs> impossible. Now, now some days we might, might look like that's what happened. That's, 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 that's not possible. possible. We know that. We have to choose to put that clothing on. You know what? We have to choose to put a God love on. We have to choose to wear that and to walk that out of our life. And, and so, so when, when you, you, when you when understand, understand that, 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 that love is a love of choice, choice it's a love, love of will, and it, it, it gives a better sense, sense of, of God's love for you. you. See, See, God, God loves, loves you and me with a God, God love. He, he chose, chose to, to love us. He chose to love us. And he chose us when we were in our worst. First John 4, chapter 4, verse 9 says, and this is the love of God that was manifested towards us that God sent His only Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Pastor David been talking to law from the book of Romans about that propitiation of Christ. But that is God's love for us. See, God literally chose to send Jesus to die on the cross for us while we were in the mud. We were sinners sinner, running, running away, away from, from God, God. had no desire, desire to please God. God. Yet Jesus, Jesus came, came and died on the cross for us. For us. See, See, that, that love was not merited by anything we could do then, then nor that, that we could do now. now. It is it by his choice. choice. Romans 5 8 says, says that God demonstrates his, his love towards, towards us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While, While we stuck, we, we were in the mire. The, the stench was horrible. horrible. That's, That's when Jesus came and died for us. us. And if so you don't you hear anything else this morning, morning that I say in this, in this teaching, teaching, I, I, I want, want you to understand and hear that that, that true of God and love is unconditional. And that's, that's so crucial, crucial because, because it will free you from, from having to try to earn God's love. There's, There's not, not a single, single thing you can do in your life that would make God, God love you more than He loves you right now. Amen. Not, not one single thing. thing. But, but you know, know it's also free in that it frees us as we understand that our God love, love. Not, not only do we receive that love of God unconditionally, but it frees us to love others in the exact same manner. Taking the burden off of us of whether or not you think that person deserves your love. Guess, Guess what? what? A God love says love them anyway. anyway. You're, You're free, free to love them anyway. anyway. Just, Just as God, God loves, loves you. you. We're, We're free, free to be loved by God unconditionally and in turn, we are, we are free, free to love others unconditionally. Isn't that Isn't awesome? awesome? That is that awesome. awesome. 
But the fact is, we're not only free to love or not to love, we're commanded to We're commanded to love with God. There was, there was a, in the book of Matthew, there's a lawyer who comes to Jesus and he's, he's testing Jesus and he asks him, well, what is the greatest commandment of all? I don't know the details of part, but I kind of think he was saying, telling Jesus, what's the minimum I can get away with? I can relate to that. Have you ever told God that? What's the minimum let me get away with? And I think that's what the lawyer was doing, and Jesus answered him. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. And so Jesus was telling him, you want to know what the minimum is? The minimum you get away with is love. Unconditional love. Love towards me. Love, love towards, towards God, God and love, love towards, towards others. others. That's, That's the minimum. minimum. See, it's, it's an unconditional, sacrificial love. love. And with, with this being the case, case, if this is the greatest commandment, then we probably need to have an understanding about this and God love. love. Understand, understand what, what it is, is as well as understand how to walk that out in our life. And so and this morning, morning I want to really look at, at three Point Point concerning concerning God God love. First, first I want to look at its supremacy. And I, mean, it, 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 I want to look, look at its importance. Its great importance in, in our walk with Christ. Christ. Second, Second, I want to look, look at the characteristics of God and love themselves. I want to talk about what it is and also talk about what it isn't. And the third is I want to talk about the fact that it's eternal. And so. The first, the first point, point the, the supremacy of love, in, in chapter 12, Paul had been, been talking about spiritual gifts, gifts and even, even, even the ministries that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit had given within, within the church. church. And, and I don't I have, have a slide, slide there, there, but if, if you'll, you'll turn, turn with me, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, first, first Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 27. Now, now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After, After that, that miracle, miracle, then the gift, the gift of healings, healings health, administration, variety of tongues, tongues are, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gift of healings? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But then he says in verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and I will show you a more excellent way. See, Paul goes as far as to say that this love is even the more excellent way beyond spiritual gifts, and even the ministries the Holy Spirit gives us. And so as we look into uh, chapter 13, starting in verse 1 this morning, let's see what this love is. And uh, first of all, let's see its importance. And so in verse 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have, becoming, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. You know, the... Uh, the Holy Spirit was, was manifesting his gifts within the church in Corinth in abundance. Uh, they, were, they were a church filled with the, the spirits or with the gifts of the Spirit, and, and apparently they held uh, a particular gift, the gift of tongues, in high esteem. And, and Paul, knowing this, uh, he, he kind of addresses that, the, 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 the love, love is even of greater great importance than that. that. There's, There's nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with, with, with the, the gifts, gifts of the Spirit. Spirit. I, love I love the gifts, gifts of the Spirit. Of the Spirit. I, I, I desire the gift of tongues. I've never received it. I prayed for it many times. I've never received it. And I read the word and says, but earnestly seek the gift. So I have sought it. I don't know if the Lord is going to give it to me, but for them, the gift of tongues they were using was really without the foundation of love. And, and that's Paul's point. Whether it's, it's a spiritual gift or it's a ministry administered by the Spirit, it's for the purpose of of the edification of the body, but if we're doing anything without the, the motivation being agape love, if we're doing anything but not with the motive of love, then it becomes worthless. If, if, if you're, you're speaking, speaking in tongues, tongues, if you have the tongues, tongues of angels, angels but, but you're, you're doing, doing so without, without love, then it says you're a voice maker. maker. You're not you're doing, doing anything. anything. You're, you're pointing, pointing to yourself. yourself. You're not, not edifying. <laughs> the body of Christ. 
And, and so the, these, all, all the spiritual gifts had a purpose, and it, it was ultimately to bring, to grow up the church, to edify the body. It, the spiritual gifts were never for the purpose of any individual receiving them, putting themselves up on a pedestal, making much of themselves. It was never, that's the opposite of love. But that's what was happening in Corinth. They, they, were, they were using these gifts that the Holy Spirit was giving them, but they were using them out of the arena of love, outside of that arena of love. And therefore, they weren't being used to build up the body, but they were actually starting to separate the body. They were causing divisions within the body of Christ because they weren't being used out of love. And really, it's no different today. Now, now I, I've got nothing, absolutely nothing against spiritual gifts. I love spiritual gifts. I, I, I think they're healthy for the body. I love to see the, the Holy Spirit manifested and doing His work. I really do. But I have conversations with uh, certain people with come from various charismatic church, and I always hear them describe their church as Holy Spirit-filled speaking in tongues. Nothing wrong with that. But I've never once had somebody come and tell me, my, yeah, my church is Holy Spirit-filled, dripping wet in agape love. Never once have I had somebody tell me that about their church. The emphasis is always on the, the gift, not necessarily on the love. Now, you show me a church, Holy Spirit filled, dripping with agape love, I want to be in the middle of that church. I want that to be this church, this body. I realize that the church is a universal church, a body of Christ. I, I, I'm talking about assemblies together. We, we should be spirit-filled, but we should be dripping wet in agape love. That's how we should minister to one another. That's how we should, should lift up the body together. Chuck Smith noted from Galatians 5.22, when you're talking about the, the, the fruit of the spirit, the, the first fruit mentioned is agape, but then he, he notes joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are all really just characteristics of that first fruit, agape. They're just, they're just love being manifested out. In long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See, that's, that's love in action. Again, we see that everything hangs off of this love. Everything. And Paul says, and though I have the gift of prophecies and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith and so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. I don't know about you, but if you've ever met somebody that, that really has a gift of, of knowledge and wisdom, especially within the scriptures, it's a wonderful gift that they have. And, and when, I, when I went through ministry school, the, the pastor who was over my school at, at Cross Christian Fellowship, Pastor Scott Tom, he had that gift. And I had to say that I, I had to confess, I, I kind of coveted that gift. It, it was amazing. He, he used to do the No Other Doctrine radio broadcast on KNKT on Saturday mornings. And callers would just call in. He had no idea what they were going to ask him. And within a minute, he was ready to give them a biblical answer to their question and lead them to the truth of God's word. That was an amazing gift. He didn't have time to prepare. He didn't have time to go study it and pray about it. It was just a gift that God gave him. Now, if they had hired me for that, after the first call, they'd have run me smooth out of the studio. That's not the gift I have. I, I, I don't have that ability. I study scripture, but I don't have that knowledge and I don't have that retention of scripture like Pastor Scott Tom does. But as I read this, it doesn't matter because you know what? The greatest thing is, is love. It, it's using the gift that God has given you within the foundation of love. That, that's the important thing. That's a great gift to have, all the knowledge in the world. But what's greater is love. Carrying that gift out, acting out in that love. That's the most important thing. See, it's not in what gift we have, but are we exercising that gift in love? And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Do you know that you can do the right things for the wrong reason? 
You can serve in ministry diligently, but for the wrong reason. For any motive, if, if any motive is outside of love, it's for the wrong reason. We can sacrifice, we can give, give of our time, give of our finances, give everything we have, but if it's not out of motive of love, then it becomes something about either self-gain or pride or we're trying to earn something before God. See, those are all the wrong motives that we tend, we can if it's not out of love. It, it's self. It's something so we get something back out of it. And sometimes the gospel itself can be preached from a motive other than love. Paul wrote in Philippians talking about some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill, the former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely. That's crazy. So, so you preach the message of God's unconditional love out of selfish motives? But we can. We can if we don't check our heart and make sure what our motive is. It has to be out of love. So love is supreme. It's of the greatest importance, even greater than that of the spiritual gifts or ministries or even of sacrifices that we might give. So again, we, we must continually be examining our heart against God's word and, and asking the Holy Spirit, reveal to us, reveal to us, what is our motive in the things we're doing? If it's anything less than love, we're, we're fooling ourselves. So we see the importance of love. It, it's supreme, but let's look at the characteristics of love. So love, what is it? L let's look at what it is and what it isn't. The first thing it says that love suffers long. Your translation may say love is patient, but it suffers long and it's kind. It, it doesn't envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. So the first thing we see is that it suffers long and it's kind. Some translations again say patient. But the point is that love is willing to endure and suffer for a long, long, long time. We're pretty good for the first long, the second long, eh, the third long, most of us have fallen off. It suffers a long time. This, but this is one of the aspects of God's love towards me that I so appreciate. He had to be so long-suffering with me. Even after I became a believer, he still is long-suffering with me. See, he is so patient with me. And, and I believe that that's, that was the heart when Jesus told his disciples, you don't forgive somebody seven times, 70 times seven, because love is long-suffering. It, it, it's long-suffering. It's willing to go on and on in, in patience, to endure and to endure. And it's hard to, to love somebody with true agape love. I want to tell you what, it takes, it, it takes sacrifice on your part. I promise you, if you're loving somebody with agape love, you're sacrificing something. It's kind of like this woman who was in a grocery, who, she was grocery shopping with her little three-year-old daughter and she had her in the cart, the grocery cart, and as they passed a the candy aisle, the little girl wanted some candy, but her mother said no, and the little girl started to cry. Then the mother, so encouragingly, she told her, don't be upset, Janie. I know you don't like shopping, but we only have a few more aisles to go. But unfortunately, the next aisle was a toy aisle. And so the little girl, again, she asks her mother for a toy, and the mother says no. And this time, the little girl starts to throw a tantrum. And again, the mother so gently says, don't be upset, Janie. Please, try to be calm. There's only one more aisle left to go. And when they finally got to the checkout stand, the little girl saw a little plastic doll there by the checkout, and she asked her mother if she could have that. But once again, her mother told her no, and the little girl, she started crying and throwing another tantrum. But once again, the mother, with encouragement and gentleness, said, Janie will be finished in less than five minutes. Just hang in there. Then you can go home and have a wonderful nap. And a man, hearing the whole ordeal, the whole ordeal came up to the mother, and he, and he said to her, excuse me, he said, but I couldn't help but hear you speaking to your daughter, and I have to tell you, I admire your patience with little Janie. But the mother looking at him funny says, oh no, you've got it all wrong. My daughter's name is Allison, I'm Janie. <laughs> sometimes, 
Love requires long suffering. Sometimes we might even have to coach ourselves through that. Have the patience, right? Love suffers long and is kind. But in addition to patience and kindness, love also places others first. Love doesn't envy the blessings that others receive. Love doesn't say, oh man, I was supposed to get that. I was supposed to win that. Dang, I never win anything. Love rejoices for them, celebrates for them and with them. Love doesn't demand to be the center of attention. Love humbles itself. See, love's focus is on others, not on self. And, and we all should be admitting this is hard to do because you know what? Our flesh want it, want, wants what it wants, and you know what it wants most? For us to be in the limelight. It's about us. We all know that. You always hear, look at a group photo. Who's the first person you look in the photo, and you determine if it's a good photo? By you. Everybody else could look horrible, but you look good. You say, oh, man, this is great. Let's post it. But if you look bad, you're in arms if they're going to put that on Facebook. It's all about us. That, our love is all about us. It's about the flesh loves ourselves. But in order to love with agape love, we, we have to learn to die to ourselves, to our own wants, to the wants of the flesh. In Philippians uh, chapter 2, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, love others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to... Uh, to be used in his, to his own advantage, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. We are to have the mindset of Jesus Christ concerning love. Love also is not puffed up. I, you know, I, I used to, uh, when I would snorkel in the ocean, uh, the few times I've been blessed to do that in my life, there was this, it's a little kind of a, it's not a pretty fish, but it's a small fish, really slow. It's called a blowfish or a puffer fish. Very small fish, but its only defense is it will ingest water, and God has created it where, where it's a domino, can, can swell up, and it becomes the size of a ball, like a basketball. And, and so it enlarges itself many times its actual size by ingesting the water or the air. And, and I was thinking, we do the same thing. We, we can tend to build ourselves up beyond who we really are to other people. It's called pride. See, making much about ourselves to others. But, but when we're doing this, we're, we're misleading. It, that's not love because we're, we're, we're putting the focus on us, trying to make something of ourselves. But love seeks to raise others up. See, love puts somebody else above ourselves, not ourselves above them. Love seeks to raise others. It says, love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, it's not provoked. It thinks no evil. Now, that's in the New King James. The, the New Living Translation for thinks no evil says it keeps no record of wrong. Ouch. That hurts. I know my heart was convicted as I studied that. You know, Psalms 103 tells us that our sins have been removed from us. For us who believe in Jesus Christ, put our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Never to meet. Never to meet us again. Never do we have to look at them, think about them, or deal with them again. They've been removed from us. Yet, I think most of us have a personal little lockbox where we hold to the sins of others that they've committed against us. God has removed our sins, but we tend to hold a record of wrong. We tend to file it away for a rainy day just in case. Yeah, I love you, but I may need this. I need me to put myself above you someday. See, Love does not harbor offenses. It doesn't hold those records of wrongs. It, it lets them go. 
Jesus warned about, the, to, uh, about a wicked servant who, after having been forgiven so much, refuses to forgive so little. And sometimes if we're holding that record of wrong, we're not forgiving. We're not giving that forgiveness. We might tell them we forgave them, but if we, as long as it's in that safety deposit box, it is not forgiven. It's held. We're, we're holding on. We're harboring it. Even under the greatest suffering, love frees us from harboring those offenses, and instead it allows us to forgive one another. When we're wrong, love enables us to forgive instead of allowing us to be chained up and bound in bitterness and rage. You know what? If you hold that, if you harbor that in your safe deposit box, it puts chains on you. It, it bounds, binds you up with, with bitterness and hate. It will destroy you. It robs you of joy and peace and hope. All because you're harboring but love doesn't do that. Love lets go of that. Look at Cain. Cain was bitter because his brother's sacrifice was, was accepted before God. His was not. And God, God told him, sin is lurking at your door. You need to master it. And he refused to do so. Instead, he held on to that bitterness. And that bitterness drove him to, to murder his brother. Yeah, it fills us with rage and hate. The, a true story, uh, a gentleman named Andy and his wife, Kate Grosmere, they, they had a 19-year-old daughter. Her name was Anne, and um, she was at her boyfriend's house, and she was breaking up with her boyfriend, and within that breakup kind of came a dispute or a confrontation, and, and the boy's name was Connor, and Connor took his dad's shotgun and he, he was going to kill himself, but, but within that altercation, the gun went off, instead taking Anne's life, 19-year-old daughter. And, and the Gr Grossmeyers, they, in the midst of, uh, of a horrific tragedy and, and, and a great loss, their hearts were so broken, but in the midst of that, they felt Jesus tell them, you need to forgive Connor. You need to not harbor that. You need to let go of that and forgive him. And, and Connor himself, he was devastated by what had happened. But, but the Grossmeyers, they, they, they not only forgave Connor, but you know what? They chose to love Connor with an unconditional love. They chose to love somebody that had just foolishly caused an incident that took their 19-year-old daughter from them. And they chose to love him. Connor went to court and, and he was sentenced 20 years in, pres in prison. And both Andy and Kate visit him regularly and, and they contact him weekly while he's in prison. And in an interview, Connor said, there's no other explanation for the gift forgiveness that the gross mirrors uh, uh, showed me. Normal people don't forgive the man who kills their daughter. Normal people would hate and condemn. Normal people would be angry and hold on to that anger and wish me nothing but evil and probably want me killed. The Grossmeyers decided to respond with forgiveness and respond in love. And that, that's nothing but the love of God shining through them. Connor was not a believer when this incident happened, but through the love of that family, he accepted Christ while he was in prison. And he, and he came to know the Lord and surrender his life to him. And since that happened in 2010, both Kate and Andy have become Connor's spiritual parents and, and to come alongside of him and, and, and nurture this newfound faith, his walk with Christ, even attending his baptism. But you know, they were able to love with a love that keeps no record of wrong. See, they well understood that it was their sin that put Jesus on the cross. And God forgave them of that. Who would they be if they didn't extend that love and that forgiveness to Connor? That's agape love. God first loved us, therefore we can love others unconditionally, even when they take our 19-year-old daughter from us. 
It says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. You know, the culture today, you hear tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. But, but the thing about tolerance, tolerance, first of all, is not necessarily very loving. And, and tolerance also does not necessarily rejoice in truth. For instance, you may consider, uh, many will, will consider any stance against same-sex marriage or any sexual immorality for that point. They'll consider any stance against that as unloving. But we read here that, that, that the loving, love does not rejoice in iniquity. See, love tells the truth, and, and it's the matter in which we do it. What is the heart behind it? It rejoices in the truth. See, if we truly love somebody, we're not worried about their short-term condition. We're worried about their eternal state. If they remain walking in the path they're in, they're going to be bound to hell. How loving is it if we leave them in that, on that path? And don't, in love, come, come and, and speak with them. Share God's love with them. Now, we've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we do that, we've got to be, check our heart. Remove the log from our own eye first. But love doesn't allow us. True love reveals the truth about the cost of sin. See, true love stands on biblical truth even in opposition to the culture. It's, it's not the popular thing to do, but it's the loving thing to do. But not with a motive of condemnation, but instead a motive of restoration. Paul dealt with that in the Corinthian church. Back in chapter 5, there was a gentleman. He, he, he was living with his, his mother-in-law. He, he was having relations with his mother-in-law. And it says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And see, the Corinthian church, they were not acting in love because they were just turning a blind eye. They were doing nothing about that. But Paul said, that's not love. He said, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. What was Paul's concern about? The immediate or the eternal? The eternal. Paul was worried that that man would, would end up in hell. He, he wanted them to be honest and be truthful with them. Cast him out. Deal with the sin in his life. Help him to deal with that sin. See, love, love is concerned about, the, concerned about the, the well-being of the person eternally as much as it is in the present. And people might ask you, what, what, what gives you a right to judge? And if you're approaching a person in truth and love, uh, we're not condemning like a judge. We're not trying to condemn them. We're trying to prevent them from being condemned. You're trying to stop them from facing judgment. You're trying to help them in that. That's loving. <clears throat> it says love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. See, love is this funny thing. It doesn't allow you to turn a blind eye Yet it forces you to look beyond the sins in a person's life to see their potential of who they can be in Jesus Christ. Not in a judgmental way, but you see, it, it hopes all things. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 14, says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. So often we see people, we look according to the flesh instead of according to how Jesus Christ sees them. You know why God loved us even when we were sinners? Because he saw the potential in us. He knew what he could do for us. He would come and clean us up. He saw us at our, at our best in him. He loved us in that way. That's what love does. It sees the best in other people. It sees who they can be in Christ. God gave me a, 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 really a lesson in that here recently. There was a homeless man who, who came to the church and he was needing to use a phone. Now, this particular man had to be a little unique in that 
He was literally wearing a leopard skin dress and had his hair in pigtails. And he, he came and he was needing a phone. And as soon as I seen him in the church, I knew the Holy Spirit told me, you need to go talk to that man. And I, I wish I could say that I was completely obedient and immediately went over there and started sharing the gospel with that man. But I'd be lying. My flesh was offended. See, I, I was seeing according to the flesh, not according to how Jesus saw that gentleman that morning. And in fairness to me, I, I had a busy schedule. And so I started focusing on the things I needed to do and I needed to go run some errands. So I got in my car and I started down the road. And I got to the print shop about two neighbors down and the Holy Spirit, I, I felt him tell me, you better turn this car around right now. I turned it around. I came back, but I was still looking at him in the flesh. There's a man standing there in a leopard skin dress, talking on a phone. And, and the Lord, it took about 15 minutes for that man to get off the phone. And I had 15 minutes for the Lord to deal with my heart. So I was just praying, Lord, let me see him through your eyes. Get rid of my, my flesh. Let me see him through your eyes. So as I was praying, he, he finished his phone call and I walked over to him and I started a conversation with him and got him a cup of coffee and he was willing to sit down at the table with me and we started to talk. Found out his name was Andy. And so we started to talk and I asked him if, if he knew anything about the gospel and he said, no, not really. And so I started, I asked him, would it be okay, Andy, if I, if I share a little bit about the gospel with you? And so I, I started talking with Andy about the gospel and the most amazing thing happened. I no longer saw a man sitting across the table from me in a leopard skin dress and in pigtails. I was oblivious to what he was wearing or how he looked. But God poured that love through me. And what I saw was a man that desperately needed to know that God loved him and sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to hang on the cross for him. See, what I saw was a man that desperately needed God to break those chains of bondage that he was in and free him from the life he was living. And so as I began to talk with Andy and share the gospel, I didn't have to convict him of his lifestyle. He was already convicted, even with tears running down his face as he told me, God hates me because who I've become. And I told him that, that nothing's further from the truth. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you, regardless. And, and, and in our conversation sharing the gospel, Andy agreed that he was a sinner and he was willing. And he, and he prayed. He prayed with me that, that he could receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I got him a Bible, prayed over him encouraged him, he picked up his bags and he walked out the doors. He told me he was trying to work his way back to Houston. Walked out the doors. Today, I don't know. I don't know where Andy is. I don't know if he's still wearing a dress. But what I do know is God told me to love him with an unconditional love. Look past my bias, look past my flesh. Love him as Jesus loves him. And, and I know, I know with all my heart that God's going to complete that work that he began in Andy that morning. I know he is. We have to be obedient. If we'll step out in obedience, love is a choice. If, if we will willingly step into that choice and love somebody the way Jesus loves them, God's love will pour through us. I promise you, it will pour through us. But we have to make that choice. I had to decide that I was going to sit there and give Andy my time and allow the Holy Spirit to work through me. I know that what the Lord loves, asks for us is that we love unconditionally, no matter who that is. No matter how much that person offends us, can we look past that? See, love hopes all things, believes all things. It sees them for what, what Jesus Christ will do in them. Let 
Love never fails, but whether, where, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. So talking of, of Jesus returning, he's going to set everything right, and we only know in part. But see, the one thing that is going to remain is love. It's love. The, the, all the gifts, even all the ministries within the church, they're, they're, they're going to go away. They're going to serve their purpose, and they're going to go away. But love is going to remain, meaning it's never going to suffer ruin. Uh, all the gifts of the Spirit, they're short-term, but love is eternal. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For we now see in a mirror, in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest is love. We, we are... are understanding, even if we spend a lifetime studying the scriptures and, and seeking the truth, our understanding is just a glimpse of God's reality, having an understanding of God. See, his ways are so much higher than our ways. We can't have a full understanding in this life of, of, of God and his purpose and even his love. But one day we will. But, but while we have this little tiny window, we're so often sitting in the judgment seat, even of God, questioning how God's conducting his creation. Uh, and we're like this little, little infant that's not even able to talk yet, criticizing how a president of the United States is running his cabinet. No information, no, so limited in even understanding. A baby knows two things, they're hungry and they're tired, and probably three, they probably need their diaper changed. And that's kind of how we are in reality. We know very few little things. But can we trust in God? See, faith, hope, and love. That's what he's given us to hold to, and the greatest of these is love. John, 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed to us what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah for that. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Chad, if you can bring the worship team and if I can have some of the elders and the pastors come up for prayer. We, uh, you know, the first question, the, the, the most significant thing about this agape love it's the very love in which God first loved us. And you have to understand that if you've never experienced his love, if you've never come and surrendered to that love that he gives so freely, I, I want to let you know that it's impossible for you to love with the same kind of love as you never have experienced. And so this morning we're going to have some pastors and elders up front and if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, I encourage you, just come up and just tell him, you know what? I want to know God's love today. I want to know the love that put Jesus Christ on the cross to pay my sin. And they, they would love to pray with you. But you know, we don't have an excuse to not love others, to not be patient with others. We don't have an excuse to not suffer long because the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 5, that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So you know what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God's love is in you. And it wants to pour out to people. But so often we fail to be willing to allow that love to be poured out. We harbor things that people do to us. We hold on to bitterness and rage and anger. But you know what? This morning's a wonderful time for you to come up and for you to open those safe deposit boxes. Empty that out. Those things you're holding on to, that, those things that are causing bitterness in your heart, the Holy Spirit 
his, his full love is in you, enabling you to do that, but you can come and you can surrender that. To God this morning. You, you, you can bring those offenses and you can put them in a shredder this morning. Never, never again to have to remember those. And, and you can allow God's love to wash over you in a whole new way, in a refreshing way. Whatever it is, if there's something that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you, or even right now, and saying, man, you're not loving in that way. There's something holding you from walking out in that agape love. You have an opportunity. I invite you to come up this morning and just pray. You don't have to air your dirty laundry. Just say, man, I really need the Holy Spirit to pray for me. I really need you to pray over me this morning. And just surrender that to Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that your long-suffering, your love is inconceivable. Yet you place it in our hearts that we can love others in that very manner in which you've loved us. God, thank you for your long-suffering. Forgive us when we fall so, so short of that, Lord. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. I pray that not a person here leaves today harboring some bitterness in their heart. But God, that they would just come forward and they would allow you to let them lay that at the altar. Let go of it. Be healed. Walk in your love. And so we just ask and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.